Okay, let's try to make this work again. I think this never works. Really. I think the school I find ever works for the uh, airplay. Okay, there we go. All right, so I'll send a link to, actually forgot to upload the uh, link to the website. Just one second. Oh, we don't see this here, okay. There we go. Access to. There we go, finally. Okay, that's great. Okay, so let's begin the uh, lecture night. Oh, I sent the uh, link to the Zoom actually, but I'll actually also, um... okay, yeah, thanks. This doesn't work out. I hope it stays there. All right, so let's get started. So welcome to lecture nine. So um, as I posted on the um, classroom, today will be the uh, last offline lecture. I have um, um, trouble next week and um, actually for the next three weeks. So I'll see you on I will still see you through Zoom, but this will be our last offline lecture. And it's good that yeah, we're gonna discuss BERT at least offline, so it's great. A few announcer, announcements first. So the assignment three is due today at 11 p.m. So don't forget to submit the 
the IP, IPIMB file, remember that um, we changed the policy from submitting the, I mean, having the option to submit either the collab link or the IPIMB file to submitting the IPIMB file. So uh, please submit the IPIMB file. Uh, you can, by the way, download it from the collab. Number two is that the uh, final project proposal is also due today at 11 p.m. So if you do not submit it, then you'll be automatically considered to have chosen the assignment option. So I know that um, I already gave comments to those who I, uh, for the, those who I have read the proposal, but um, if you have submitted after that, so you if you haven't received the comment yet, then please tell me now so that um, I can make sure to take a look at that. But if not, then I'll assume that everyone's doing the assignment option. And number three is that the, yeah, I told you about this. Uh, we'll have three more lectures. Um, I already uploaded the schedule for the lecture 10, 11, and 12. Uh, we'll, we'll actually discuss uh, T5, uh, actually was GPT-2 first? Um, probably T5 first, yeah, T5. GPT-2, and this will be just more of a, our last lecture will be more of a recent trend. Okay, so any question? All right. So um, actually today we're gonna focus on the birds. Um, so we're gonna spend a few, well, tens of minutes on really going through the overview. And then actually I will walk with you um, as I we, we read the paper. So I think that there'll be better way of uh, you to actually also to get to know what bird is. Um, I'll close this Slack. Notion. Okay. Do I need to close anything else? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so I hope you remember that we talk about BERT with respect to GPT two. I'm not GPT two. GPT Elmo and ULM, ULM fit. So remember that the um, ELMO was first proposed in 2018, or actually to be more exact, it was uh, first available, um, 27, not available, but um, people saw, people knew about it since 2017, late 2017, and then, uh, and then the ULM fit came out, and then GPT came out in the June 2018. And BERT was um, made public to the world in October. And I think probably many of you did know this already, but um, BERT stands for the Bivectional Encoder Representations from Transformer. It was created by Google Research in October 2018. And basically when it came out, it achieved the state of the art in many popular NLP tasks with just one model. So that was actually the really the fascinating thing and also it's not just one model but also there is no task specific layer they only have probably like a one or one layer for each task but nothing more so everything was tuned and then just they just have a very shallow layer for for the, each task and every everything in the bird was fine-tuned for the target task and bird uses the transformers encoder only so it doesn't use the code at all so there are actually a few uh, minor differences between the BERT and transformer. Not that many though. So number one is that BERT uses position embedding. So we talk about the fact that transformer uses the sinusoidal encoder, but BERT uses the positional embed embedding. So the difference is that I think we talk about this, but I'll just uh, uh, recap. So the sinusoidal encoder was something like this, right? We have a um, dimension axis here, so uh, like one, 
two, three, and up to, if you have a 512 dimensions, then this will be 512. Then this sinusoidal encoder, what it does is that they have a different sinusoidal um, graphs. For instance, something like this for um, d equal to one. No, not, wait, my bad, it's not dim. So what I meant is that it's actually sequence length. So the word position, basically position of a um, zero, one, two, uh, five, eleven. Then what it does is that the sinusoidal sort of encoder, we call that they basically have some sort of a, a sign embedding, and then this corresponds to d equal to one. But for d equal to two, they have a bit different. Um, graph, usually different phase and different um, shift. And they also might have uh, some other, yeah, I'm not really good at drawing this, but d equal three and et cetera. So that, that, that's the, that was the way that they defined these sinusoidal graphs. And then um, allows you to basically have a, a position embedding that just depends on the uh, deterministic depends on the uh, these sine, uh, sine and cosine graphs. But then BERT uses the uh, position embedding. What that means is that instead of having some sort of uh, these functions, these, these uh, deterministic functions, um, they basically just have, um, let's say we have a sequence length of 512 and the hidden state size is say 1024. And then essentially, what they have is something like, um, well, should be actually like that. And then, so this will be uh, same as the, the uh, sinusoidal encoder. Um, this axis will be sequence length and this axis will be um, hidden state. And then we have basically um, one vector per position, but this is basically a matrix. So um, it's a 512, oh, why is it? 512 by say 1024. So it's a matrix, it's parameters that you can train. It's actually trainable, it's trained during pre-training and also you fine tune it during um, fine tuning. Stage. So that's like one key difference. Um, number two is model size. So transformer uses six layers and recall that the uh, transformer basically has an encoder here and um, this has uh, six layers and then they basically have a decoder. This also has six layers, but then BERT use only encoder but then they have 20, up to four, 24 layers. This is for the uh, um, large model. And then that means basically then approximately um, transformer is kind of having 12 layers because they have six layers on the encoder side and six layers on the decoder side. BERT uses 24 layers. So it's even two times larger than the uh, encoder and decoder combined in transformer. So they just use, a, uh, this is transformer, but then BERT basically just have the uh, 12, uh, not 12, 12, but 24 layers of uh, Just the encoder side, but other than that, there there are very minimal differences. To be honest, um, of course, uh, Bird is not six to six; only has the, uh, encoder, right? So um, that means that it's not actually using some um, sequence generation loss. It's actually using the uh, mask language model loss to train the uh, encoder side. So it uses the uh, basically embedding of the encoder to get the mask words. Unlike transformer, which use the decoder to generate the sentence. So um, I'll, I'll give an example. So if you actually draw encoder here, and then suppose that the sentence is, um, yeah, I'll say,
let's say the today is hot, then what BERT does is that if you, this was a language model, then it will try to actually guess what the word is here. So if you actually do this, then this embedding vector should be guessing what the next word should be. But that's the typical language model. In the mask language model, what they do is um, they instead basically inject noise into the input. So for instance, they inject noise by erasing it and then basically marking this with mask. And then um, of course we will have embedding for each word, but we basically just ignore these um, embeddings because we already know what those words are, but we only consider the embeddings for the words that have mask, right? And then we try to guess what the original word was. So it's very similar to um, language model, except that the, the good part is that you do not need a decoder because you give, inject the noise on the, the input side. So that's the key difference. If you were training a language model, which is an autoregressive language model, then you will need to use decoder because otherwise um, you, you, will, you might be cheating. There is no noise injected to the input. So you might be uh, cheating. So you will always need to have the attention looking only uh, backward, not forward. That's why you need some mask attention. And also it's, uh, it's that you can, you can only, you can actually, you cannot look at the uh, what's coming after. But then if you think about this, it makes sense that this will be usually easier because, well, I used a well, relatively very easy sentence with um, last word as a mask, but then suppose that um, this was a, uh, more complicated. Um, suppose that the um, but tomorrow is cold. Then and then let's say I mask this. Uh, I think it's easy easy to see that. If you actually just saw this, there is no way to really know what this mask will be. Like, I think even for humans, right? I mean, today's what, like, is like Wednesday or today's, um, it can be anything, right? Today's my birthday. Um, but then um, if you actually have this some um, context at, at after the mask, then it's clear that it's probably easier to guess what this is. So it makes the task more doable. And also the good thing is that, of course, then if you formulate it this way, then your encoder will be, I mean, what uh, your embedding will be contextualized with respect to not only the previous words, but then also the upcoming words. So the point of the mass language model is basically, um, well, actually the, the, actually the biggest advantage of mass language model compared to the typical language model is that um, if you are actually not generating sentence, then maybe mask language model is better loss to train for than the language model. So, and that, that was their actually um, hypothesis. And uh, in fact, in many um, empirical experiments, it's actually has been shown that this way of uh, basically injecting noise is better than the um, actually autoregressive loss like GPT-2, GPT-1 for fine tuning to the uh, target task. That's exactly why uh, people don't use, for instance, GPT-3 for fine tuning um, some, or I mean, haven't been using a lot of uh, GPT-2 or 3 or some of these decoder-based models for um, say, do it to do well on squat or QA systems. So mass language models certainly has benefits, but it's inherent disadvantages that it cannot generate sentence. So it's not generative model. And it's all worth noting that this is also called um, closed test. And that basically means that you're trying to guess the, um, the hidden word. And also it's uh, important. Uh, I think another way to call this is denoising autoencoder because 
you basically inject noise and then you try to denoise it and then obtain whatever you entered. So that's basically the uh, point of autoencoder, right? So you're you're creating an autoencoder, but usually autoencoder just works by having a bottleneck between the um, input and the output. So, but then in this case, well, you injected some noise and then you're trying to reconstruct your original input. So that's why people call it denoising autoencoder. So, this, so sometimes people call this, uh, yeah, something that's similar to BERT is denoising autoencoder objective. Okay. Um, and then the training environment for BERT was a bit different from Transformer 2. So uh, number one is that the BERT was fixing the length up to 512. I told you that the senior soda embedding, the benefit of that is that you can basically arbitrarily increase the length. But in practice also, uh, we, we, we talk about the fact that even if you can increase it theoretically, in practice doesn't really, really mean much because you cannot really generalize a lot, generalize well um, for lengths that you haven't seen during training. And um, so what BERT does is that just assume that your maximum length will be 512 and then just never goes above that. Um, okay, there is a question. Hmm. So maybe I can answer your question after this slide. So, and then your batch size um, will be up to 512 in BERT. So that's actually very large. So um, in fact, I remember that was it maybe 2017, like right before BERT, um, Jan LeCun, Jan LeCun is a chief scientist at Meta and he was one of the really the, um, well, I mean, really the pioneers of deep learning. He actually invented CNN. And he once said that um, there will be very rare cases that you will need best size um, 32 or higher. So, I mean, 32 is like what he said was like the maximum batch length that you probably, batch size you probably need. And of course it was wrong because um, in fact, the, the bird's performance came from really the, this large batch size. It is, it might, it might be true that actually when you're fine tuning, you don't really need um, larger than 32 batch size, but in pre-trading, definitely this is very important. And that's actually why also you need really a lot of GPUs. Because uh, of course, it, fitting in one uh, best size of one is also not too easy. But then uh, fitting in five twelve is really difficult, especially back then with the GPUs they had. Because it was time that we we didn't even have B B hundred. We had a P forty P hundred. These were not supporting the half precision. Um, Nvidia GPUs were not. Um, but the 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 TensorFlow, Tensor, I mean the Google's TPU chips supported the half precision back then, though. Um, so that was also why that they could actually do pretty well. Of course, right after this, they actually, I mean, around this time, the hundred was also released by NVIDIA in twenty eighteen. So the Volta architecture uh, was well supporting the um, half precision. So that was at least very encouraging for many people. Back then they used that 64 TPU chips. And um, I think it's around 16 V100 GPUs and that's a single DGX station for a large model. And they trained for four days with high network bandwidth. Um, so, yeah. So, so did that, here the high network bandwidth means that um, you might wonder why you need high network. And the reason why is that, so the, the way that this works is it's first assuming that you can fit in at least um, best size of one into each GPU. In fact, if you're using 16 V100, uh, actually I'll talk about in the terms of TPU chips. If you're using 64, Well, that means you're having a batch size of eight per chip, right? So that's why eight times 64 will be 512. Then you compute the gradients in each chip with the best size of eight. 
And then you, but then you want to actually train this model as if the best size is 512. So you, you actually accumulate the gradient. I mean, not accumulate to be more exact, actually um, basically sum and average the gradients from these um, 64 TPU chips. But if you want to do so, then you have to transfer the gradients information to the, um, the central machine that contains all the um, these uh, gradients, right? So that means you have to actually transfer gradients from GPU to GPU. And how do you transfer these gradients in, um, in the old in the, uh, old scenarios uh, in traditional computing? You usually actually go through CPU, so basically RAM. Um, so these gradients go to uh, the CPU and then they actually travel through CPU and then go to another GPU. So because all the GPUs in the uh, old days were connected to only the uh, CPU, but they were not interconnected. So um, we have like GPU here. These are GPUs. Let's say you have four GPUs and then back then um, everything was like this. This was CPU. So that means then if you want to travel from GPU to GPU, then you basically have to go through um, this CPU bottleneck. And that also means that usually you have to, because you have to store this gradient somewhere, you have to actually store this in the RAM and then you actually you know, bring this again to the, uh, um, for the target GPU, it's very slow. So um, that actually means two things. One is that first of all, I mean, actually, this is even, it's, it's actually in the, in the one, this is even one server. If you're actually going from ser uh, one server to another server, then now you're even talking about uh, bandwidth between two nodes, right? You actually have a GPU, um, some gradients here, and then you have to, you, if you want to go to another GPU, then basically you um, travel like this, and then you go here, and then you, go here. So it's very slow, right? Um, so number one, you need very fast node to node bandwidth. So this has to be very fast. Um, this part has to be very fast. And then also you have to have also very, um, it, it will be ideal if you can have some direct link between GPUs, for instance, um, why not go from here to here directly, right? Instead of going through CPU. So um, for the net for the node to node network, that's why you need something like infinite band instead of Ethernet ca cable. Uh, Ethernet cable is very slow. It's I mean it's actually supporting only up to ten gigabits per second, and that's actually very slow if you think about how fast you want to transfer these gradient values. Infinite band can be as fast as for instance seventy gigabit gigabits or even faster these days. So that's why you need a very good network bandwidth. And also you need to have some um, connection between GPUs instead of um, just the relying on the, um, the uh, going through CPU. And that means then you will need something like NVLink that NVIDIA for instance supports. That's basically uh, GPU to GPU direct link, uh, direct network um, path. So th those were the really crucial things in these machines to make it really fast. Okay, so I'll now answer questions. Um, so uh, the first question by uh, Juno is that uh, what's written under 24 layers, okay. Um, I say it's large, yeah, this is large. Uh, is denoising transformer different? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by denoising transformer. Is there a model called denoising transformer? Maybe I'm not aware of that. But well, I think if your transformer's objective is to denoise something, then you can call it denoising transformer. But um, denoising auto encoder is a very generic term. It doesn't have to use the transformer architecture. It's a just general term that means that you want to first um, inject some noise to the input, and then you want to reconstruct that. Okay, yep. All right, so, so quick comparison between um, BERT, GPT, and ELMO. So BERT was created by Google in October 2018. GPT was 
actually four months before that by OpenAI in June 2018. And Elmo was actually from AI2. Um, it's like four months before GP2. Um, and then the architecture is, as you see, BERT uses transform encoder, GPT uses transform decoder, and the ELMO used by directional austere. Model size, as you see, GPT and ELMO are around the same size, and BERT actually is about three times bigger. Corpus size, uh, ELMO uses a 1 billion word benchmark, GPT uses books corpus, which is 800 million, and BERT uses 3.3 .3 billion, which is actually Wikipedia plus the books corpus. Of course, there are other differences too. Like, for instance, BERT is actually a mass language model, GPT is auto regressive, ELMO is also auto regressive, but in two directions. I didn't put those here. Um, and you might wonder then why BERT was so good and it's so popular, but then GPT ELMO didn't really work out. Um, ELMO didn't really work out because it was using L um, LSTM, and basically it didn't have any attention architecture inherently into it, which, mean, which meant that, um, of course, it cannot handle long, long, long term dependency. GPT, I think uh, there are largely um, two reasons. One is that it was decoder only, and I think decoder only is especially in this such small size has a uh, much more limitations compared to the uh, mass language model, which is by default, they're using encoders, so they are bi-directional, unlike GPT, which is just unidirectional. And also, they use relatively small batch size. That's why they didn't need they didn't need uh, that many GPUs compared to BERT. So, which means I think BERT did better fine tuning than GPT back then. They actually had a, a very good idea of, of uh, actually very good initialization of uh, um, say you know, how how big the batch size should be, the training routine. In fact, the, the training routine was very pretty, very crazy that it took a lot of time for them to actually release that. And I mean, pre-training routine. And also it's worth noting that um, back then, I remember that uh, I was actually at Daver back then and then um, this bird came out and we really wanted to reproduce it really badly. I think you were there too, right? <laughs> yeah, I remember we were in actually, um, uh, so, and then we actually created a few special purpose teams like uh, task forces. And then um, we the, the purpose of the task TF was basically to reproduce BERT because uh, Google released the model parameters. I mean, the, the, um, we could use that, but then we couldn't actually create that because they never had a, well, I mean, really working pre-training routine. And that also required a lot of uh, GPUs and uh, all the infrastructure. Uh, neighbor didn't have that back then. Um, actually, very very small number of companies had that. So it was a, uh, um, and then it was not easy at all because uh, starting from even the network bandwidth, if you don't have a proper uh, infinite band or uh, these Envilink, it will take um, say like four to five more day, uh, times of uh, time. So not four days, but it could be like one month. And now we're talking about one month that we, we don't even know whether it's going to work at the end. So it's very difficult to make it work um, in a short period of time. So I wanted to say that because um, basically BERT and GPT, they're very similar. In fact, um, it, we're going to actually go through paper, BERT paper in the second half of, this, half of this class. And you will see that BERT actually, the paper says a lot of uh, very defensive, um, they are actually very defensive about um, the difference between their work uh, compared to GPT. And because they knew that the BERT was not too much different, different from GPT, it was just that they were very uh, good at finding and also executing the right um, size and the hyperparameters. So if you actually want to more, know more details about BERT, I actually recommend to take a look at this talk slice. This is actually by the uh, Jacob Devlin. He's the first author of BERT. Probably it's like two years ago, so two or three years ago. So it, it's a bit outdated, but um, at least it's, I think, very accurate description. And also it talks about the behind story of the BERT creating, BERT making. Okay, so after BERT,
there were a few um apparently bird was a very very big impact to the community because as i said it set the state of the art in many um, different tasks back then and many important tasks that nlp researchers were interested in and not just nlp but then also the um, fusion researchers were also interested because they actually saw that if such pre-training especially such pre-training that doesn't require um, supervision i mean self-supervised right it doesn't require any labeling efforts can work in nlp then they were also wondering if the same thing can actually happen in division two so it was a um, well, it was not just about transfer learning, but it was also about self-supervised -self learning. And image in the image domain, self-supervision wasn't really working well, um, except for probably like GAN. So that was why also a lot of uh, interest was going into BERT. And apparently people were trying to make a few improvements to BERT. There are a few um, people thought, well, bottlenecks. Uh, one is that, well, it requires a really big size and a lot of, um, I mean, it actually had a lot of tuning too, but then some people actually thought that maybe it was not tuned enough. So we'll talk about that very soon. And also they were um, interested in different pre-training tasks, not just the mass language model, but maybe something better or maybe something more complicated or can, can be good at, uh, can be uh, better for the um, um, this pre-training routine. And number three is, uh, can we use something else than transformer? So um, one of them is, well, I don't think people use this a lot these days, but um, well, actually they use the transformer Excel though, not the Excel net. But um, it's a worth noting because in fact, um, it actually uses transformer Excel and it's still being used uh, because this is basically the, um, they basically proposed the, not, not just them, but then they also actually proposed the relative encoding, um, position encoding, but BERT can be considered as a denoised mask auto encoder. I said this. And then ExcelNet is actually trained on autoregressive language modeling tasks, similar to GPT. Uh, but then the, again, I said that the GPT's uh, disadvantage is that it's not bidirectional. So um, they wanted to basically do something AR, autoregressive, but then also they wanted to make it bidirectional, but not like, uh, for instance, Elmo, which basically uses forward and backward um, LSTMs because they will basically require two times more parameters. So what they instead did was that they actually permute the, the input sequence and they tried to generate the, uh, target the original target sequence. So their point was that because it's permutation, um, well, now they actually have the all the input. And the also they're generating the original sequence. So it's basically um, autoregressive. It's not just a um, um, mass language model. In fact, it's very actually um, in some sense similar to, for instance, BART or um, T5 that comes after this, which we're going to talk about uh, in the next lecture. But Excelna was extremely complicated that, um, like, I think I'm not even sure anyone really reproduced it. And it actually used the uh, trans, uh, transform Excel instead of, instead of transformer, which meant that they used the relative position encoding and they segment recurrence mechanism. But then, um, it, as, as I said, that Excelna was a very complicated, so uh, it didn't really really uh, really become popular in the field. Another um, work worth noting is Verda, which was released in 2019. And it's actually exactly the same architecture as BERT. And I said exactly because if you train something with Verda, you can actually use that in the BERT um, Python code. So um, that means the weights are interchangeable. It's just that the, the way that they are trained is different. And they argued that BERT was under-trained. So what they did was that they trained BERT longer. They removed uh, actually next sentence prediction objective, which I didn't talk about in fact, but uh, BERT basically had not just the MLM, the mass language model, but they also had this uh, objective called next sentence prediction, which is trying to predict among, I think it was two or 
I don't remember exact number, number, but then there basically the model is given like two options, um, two sentences, and one of them is actual next sentence, and the other is not um, the actual next sentence. So Bert has to uh, predict that next sentence correctly. But um, they removed that because they actually found that it's not really useful. In fact, uh, the next sentence prediction accuracy was reaching something like 99% in the pre-training birds. So it was clear that it was being saturated. And we talk about this, right? Because we, we said that the, the pre-training objective has to be hard enough so that the model can learn something. Uh, in the um, text classification, it was probably not hard enough for the model to learn uh, rich linguistic features. So in that regard, um, removing such easy uh, su such easy um, objective was not um, well not too surprising. They also train on longer sequences. They dynamically change the masking patterns, and they um, because actually, it's, um, if you actually look into the origin of bird code, it's really um, amazing. I mean, how the code looks like because they actually. Um, you know, these maskings, they are random, right? You just basically put the mask randomly. And you might think that the natural way to do this is that you mask this on the fly. But then what they do is that actually, they create the TF record. Basically they create a data file that has this mask just fixed. So even if you had like hundred epochs, every epoch you are looking at the same mask in the original barcode. Um, so, it was actually, um, and the reason, well, there are many, uh, uh, I think, um, speculations, but uh, one reason is that they basically created this in a very short period of time, like three to four months, where it was created in a really short period of time um, that actually, uh, as far as I know, they started doing this after GPT-1 was released, which was in June 2018. So um, that's like four months, right? they created bird in four months and they were doing very uh, weird things like that makes um, training easier. But then if you think about it, why didn't they do dynamic masking? Why do they have same um, mask for every epoch? That's uh, something, of course, um, they could have done better, but uh, they, Robert actually um, did that. And then they were actually saying that these alone can achieve better accuracy than XLNet. So that's why people don't usually use the XLNet. Um, there are other reasons too, but, um, but even um, Roberta, I don't think people use this um, that much, even though they had good results because it was also found that, um, well, because they kind of overtrained it, it's not sometimes working well in some task. So Bert was maybe undertrained, but then still it was not overtrained. So it's working across many tasks pretty reliably. But uh, Roberta was not um, sometimes actually too much reliable. So I think he'll still use Bert a lot. I mean, these days, apparently. Um, it's really amazing, actually, that people still use this. Um, I mean, use this uh, for such a long period of time. Like it's been almost four years. I have two slides. I'm not know why. Whoa. That's really weird. Did this bug? <laughs> yeah, I think something's wrong with the um. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So um, that's good. So let's have a five minute break and let's come back. When we come back, we're going to go through a bird paper so that we can now um, really see these things in the paper. Um, yeah, so see you in five minutes. Hey. Excuse me. Yep.
so uh, I think like uh -huh. since being here for four or uh, three, I came in the class, like uh, in face to face. But I think I, I never like uh, was on the shit. Oh, really? Because yeah, I think I remember you were here. Yeah, mostly. And uh, I sent a message to the TA and okay. say, I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. you should wait it next time. Okay. I see. Um, so, yeah, so you you never uh, wrote your name there? Or? The thing is, at first I didn't, didn't see the, the paper. Uh -huh. And then uh, I saw it, but like people keep taking it. And I yet, see. And then I was like, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so let's see. Hmm. Yeah, because I remember that you were here. Um, uh, yeah, I started coming from yeah. the 25th of March. Yeah, oh, I see, I see. That's why you didn't know. Okay. Okay, then. Yeah. Um, I think then. Um, so you started, you, you were not taking class before 25th of March or? Yeah, no, I was in the online. Oh, okay, okay. I see, I see. But you never actually put your name on the attendance uh, online or? Online, yes. I, I put it online. Now. Okay, and after that, you never put attendance there. Okay. Yeah, but like when I went there, I didn't put it online. I see, I see, I see, I see. It's okay. Yeah, I think she'll be fine. I mean, uh, just yeah, tell the TA that. Um, yeah, I said that. Uh, um, I think you. Okay, we can. I think I came every time. Even yeah, yeah. I think I saw you. <laughs> I think I saw you every time too. So. Yeah. Okay. So then, I think for every offline lecture that um, we had, I think um, I can probably um, um, also confirm that you are here. So I think okay, so, uh, tell TA that. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, I think um, probably for other lectures, like before twenty fifth of March, and for Zoom lectures, then I think. Um, yeah, but like for Zoom, Zoom lecture, I took the. Oh, you took the lessons, right? Okay, that sounds good. Then. That, I think should be fine. Then. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, let's get started. Um, what was the question? Looks like. Okay, so the question is that why the next sentence prediction is more easier than the MLM objective? Are there any sort of metrics to measure the difficulty or are they just findings from the empirical results? Um, First of all, answering your second question. Yeah, it's more of an empirical results, but then I think in many cases, it's relatively um, explainable why this could be easy. Next sentence prediction was easy because um, it was choosing between two options, if I remember correctly. Let's find this out soon. Then let's say you're given two sentences, and then um, one of them, one of those two sentences is the next sentence to the current sentence. And unless you make this problem very carefully, I mean, you unless you sample this negative um, very carefully, it's pretty obvious that um, many people will get it right, right? Not a model will get it right too. So um, NSP is much easier than word prediction because word is apparently um, there. First of all, there are too many options. It's not two options. It's like a, 
in bird their uh, vocab size is 30,000. So, and also um, it doesn't have much content. So, um, in unlike sentence. So I think that's the answer to your um, second question. Yeah, I think, or your entire question, I think. But of course, um, it's not always clear which task is harder. I think it's usually clear if some, some certain task is really easy, though. Okay. All right, so let's just uh, try to read the paper together. I think it's worth actually taking a look at this paper at least once. Um, so if you read the abstract, um, it's actually interesting to see how the things work. Before that, um, so in fact, um, it's also interesting to say that see that actually they are all from um, Google Seattle, these authors were. And in fact, um, these three people joined from the Microsoft research like uh, six months ago or one year ago, within the year, uh, one year uh, from the, um, the October 2018. So it's quite interesting that, I mean, it was very pretty good hire, right, from the Google side. And he was actually uh, my um, office mate, um, my same class. And he, he basically was a very fresh um, researcher in the uh, Google that he joined like in May, 2018. So it, he was also very um, new to Google. So actually everyone here was new to Google basically. Um, So if you read the abstract, it uh, says that we introduced a new language representation model co called BERT, which stands for bidirectional encoder representation from transformers. Unlike recent language representation models, um, BERT is designed to pre-train deep bidirectional representations from unlabeled text by jointly conditioning on both left and right context in all layers. As a result, the pre-trained BERT model can be fine-tuned with just one additional output layer to create state-of-the-art models for a wide range of tasks, such as question answering and language inference without substantial task-specific architectural modifications. So that's, those are the things we talk about, right? Uh, BERT is conceptually simple and empirically powerful. It obtains new state-of-the-art results on 11 natural language processing tasks. And these are very uh, popular ones. That's why also it drew a lot of attention that people are working on these. Like, I mean, every each paper was trying to do pretty well in each task. And this paper basically beats everything in one paper, including pushing the glue score. Glue is actually the um, benchmark that uh, people used to use to uh, for the text classification. Uh, now people don't use it because now it's above human performance. So now people sometimes do use super, super glue, but even then um, that's also kind of saturated these days. So, and actually they pushed the uh, score to 80.5% and it's actually 7.7% .7 improvement. So it's crazy, right? Um, and just one model, multi-NLI accuracy to 86.7%, they increased by 4.6%, squad B 1.1, question answering and test F1 to 93.2. That was 1.5. It's not too much, but then still F squad was very saturated. And I, I, I think it was the probably most popular task except for machine translation NLP back, by back, back then. Um, so in, in V2, 5.1. So these were the core, result, core results. So let's go into introduction. So language model pre-training has been shown to be effective for improving many natural language processing tasks. Uh, these include sentence level tasks such as natural language inference, paraphrasing, which aim to predict the relationship between sentences by analyzing them holistically, as well as token level tasks such as uh, named MDT recognition and question answering, where models are required to produce um, fine-grained output at the token level. There are two existing strategies for applying pre-trained language representations to downstream tasks, feature-based and fine-tuning. So basically, um, the feature-based approach such as ELMO, so basically what they're saying is that ELMO they created features or the um, contextual word embeddings, and these are used as features. They are not actually the uh, um, something that's core to the model. Use task-specific architecture that include the pre-trained representations as additional features. The fine-tuning approach, such as generative pre-trained transformer, introduces minimal task-specific parameters 
and is tra trained on the downstream task by simply fine tuning all uh, pre-trained par parameters. That was the main difference between GPT-1 and ELMO. The two approaches share the same objective function during pre-training where they use unidirectional language models to learn general language representations. But uh, the point is here is that, of course, GPT is just unidirectional. Um, also, ELMO is a bidirectional, but they're still, still, they're just concatenating two unidirectional models. We argue that culture, uh, current techniques restrict the power of the pre-trained representations, especially for the fine training approaches. The major limitation is that the standard language models are unidirectional, and this limits the choice of architectures that can be used during pre-training. For example, in OpenAI GPT, the authors use a left to right architecture where every token can only attend to previous tokens in the self-attention layers of the transformer. Such restrictions are suboptimal for sentence level tasks and could be very harmful when applying fine tuning based approaches to token level tasks, such as question answering, where it, where it is crucial to incorporate context from both directions. So that's why they uh, improve the fine tuning based approaches by proposing BERT. It elevates the previously mentioned unidirectionality constrained by using a mask language model pre training objective inspired by closed task. Uh, the mask language model randomly masks some of the tokens from the input, and the objective is to predict the original vocab ID of the um, word based only on its context. Unlike left to right language model pre-training, the MLM objective enables the representation to fuse the left and the right context, which allows us to pre-train a deep bidirectional transformer. In addition to the mass language model, we also use a next sentence prediction task that generally pre-trains text pair representations. The contributions of our paper are follows. So I think we can skip the contributions here. Um, so, um, well, so there is a, I'll, I'll also um, skip the related work, I think. Um, there are a lot of, I think uh, I recommend you to take a look at this, um, but it's pretty long, so that's why. So the, I'm going to go for section three. We introduced BERT and its detailed implementation in this section. There are two steps in our framework, pre-training and fine-tuning. During pre-training, the model is trained on unlabeled data over different pre-training tasks. Uh, for fine-tuning, the BERT model is first initialized with the pre-trained parameters. And all of the parameters are fine-tuned fine -tuned using labeled data from the downstream task. Each downstream task has separate fine-tuned models. Um, even though they are initialized with the same pre-trained parameters. That's the point of basically one model being fine-tuned to different tasks. The question answering example in figure one will serve as a running example for this section. So they basically have a pre-training architecture and pre-training model, and then they basically become their fine-tuned for each task. A distinctive feature of BERT is its unified architecture across different tasks. There is minimal difference between the pre-trained architecture and final downstream architecture. And the difference is only uh, basically one layer for each task at the, uh, at the final, um, after the final layer. And the model architecture, BERT's model architecture is a multi-layer bidirectional transformer. So they keep saying bidirectional transformer encoder, but this is like not really needed. It's transformer encoder is bidirectional, right? So they just mentioned that because they thought that uh, maybe it's not popular enough that people won't maybe understand fully. Based on the original implementation described in Baswani et al, this transformer paper and released in the tensor to tensor library. Because the use of transformers has become common and our implementation is almost identical to the original, we will omit an exhaustive background description of the model architecture and refer to reader uh, to Baswani et al, as well as ex excellent guys such as the annotate transformer. That we just talked about. So um, as you see, there is really no equation in this paper. Um, they basically don't do any um, really architecture specific or model specific um, um, novelty. In this part, we denote the number of layers uh, as L, the hidden size as H, and the number of self-attention has as A. Uh, so we primarily report results on two model sizes, um, BERT base, which has a uh, number of 12 layers, 
hidden state size says 768 and the um, attention has 12, which will be 110 million parameters. That's actually exactly the same as the GPT. Um, and BERT large is um, 12, 24 layers or twice the size, twice the number of layers and the number of heads. A number of hidden state size is the 1024 and the attention has the same 16, but because of number of layers and the hidden state size, this actually now almost um, more than triples, 340 million parameters. BERT base was chosen to have the same model size as GPT for comparison purposes. Critically, however, the BERT transformer uses bidirectional self-attention while the GPT transformer uses constrained self-attention where every token can only attend to context to its left. Just one second. So to make BERT handle a variety of downstream tasks, our input representation is able to un unambiguously uh, represent both a single sentence and a pair of sentences in one token sequence. So it's basically similar to GPT in a, in a sense that they basically concatenate the inputs. Throughout this work, a sentence can be an arbitrary span of contiguous text rather than an actual linguistic sentence. A sequence refers to the input token sequence to BERT, which may be a single sentence or two sentences packed together. So the, what that means is that um, sometimes the classification task gets two inputs and just like GPT, they concatenate those two and they're calling the concatenated one to be a sequence. And um, the each, if, if it had two inputs or two sentence inputs, then they're calling each sentence input to be a sentence. We use word piece embeddings. So this is basically B, uh, the BP by pair encoding base, but then um, they have a bit different objective uh, with 30,000 token vocab. The first token of every sequence is always a special classification token. So they always uh, have this special token. Every sequence start with a CLS token. The final hidden state corresponding to this token is used as the aggregate sequence representation for classification classification task. But in fact, um, they, it's also it's also used for retrieval um, or um, basic embedding, sentence embedding too. So they have this token, and then the token, the representation of this token is being used for. Uh, the meaning of the entire sequence. Sentence pairs are packed together into a single se sequence. We differentiate the sentence in two ways. First, we separate them with special token SCP. So uh, that's why they do something like this. Um, they have, um, for instance, uh, input one, and then they have SCP, and then they have input two. And they basically end that with also another SCP. That's what they say here. Second, we add a learn embedding to every token indicate whether it belongs to sentence A or sentence B. Um, so what this means is that um, they actually don't, they add position embedding as well as the, um, what they call uh, token type ID. It's either zero or one. And actually these are not really important. It, it turns out that it's not really important because the model is able to learn that pretty easily, but they did that. But if you actually, when you when we look into the code in the lab session on Thursday, you will see they have actually not just position embedding, but also token type ID, which is not really necessary these days. But I mean, if you're using Bird, you will need to put that in. But um, so we're we're here. Uh, second, we uh, we're okay. Actually, we're here as shown in um, Figure One. We denote input embeddings as E, the final hidden vector of this special CLS token as C. Uh, and the final hidden vector for the i the input token as a ti. For a given token, its input representation is constructed by summing the corresponding token, segment, and position embeddings. Uh, a visualization of this construction can be seen in figure two. Okay, so they're actually summing these, right? Summing. So what that means is that they have token embedding and they have position embedding, and also they have this token type embed, segment type embedding, or yeah, whatever they call it, and they just add them instead of concatenating or other things. Um, so pre-training BERT, unlike Peters et al., this is Elmo, Rutherford et al., 2018, this is GPT. We did not use traditional left to right or right to left language models to pre-train BERT. Instead, we pre-train BERT using two unsupervised tasks described in the sixth section. This step is presented in the left part of figure one. 
Task one, mass language model. So intuitively, it is reasonable to believe that a deep bidirectional model is strictly more powerful than either a left to right model or the shallow concatenation of a left to right. The, what This is basically ELMO, right? Because we concatenate the left to right and right to left. Unfortunately, standard co conditional language models can only be trained left to right or right to left since bidirectional conditioning would allow each word to indirectly see itself. And the model could trivially predict the target word in a multi-layered context. In order to train a deep bidirectional representation, we simply mask some percentage of the input tokens at random and then predict those mask tokens. We refer to this procedure as a mask language model, although it is often referred to as a closed task in the literature. In this case, the final hidden vectors corresponding to the mask tokens are fed into an output softmax over the vocab, as in a standard LM. In all of our experiments, we mask 15% of all word piece to tokens in each sequence at random. In contrast to denoising autoencoders, we only predict the um, masked words rather than reconstructing the entire input. So the point here is that the actually their work is not the first work to really talk about denoising autoencoder, but then uh, in 2008, there was no deep learning. So they were just doing some other uh, methods to do denoising. Although this allows us to obtain a bidirectional pre-trained model, a downside is that we are creating a mismatch between pre-training and fine-tuning. Um, because that means is that, uh, because you have a mask in the input during pre-training, but then in the inference, you will never see mask token, right? So that's what they mean. Since the mask token does not appear during fine tuning. To mitigate this, we do not always replace mask words with the actual mask token. The training data generator choose 15% of the token positions at random for prediction. If the i token is chosen, we replace the i token with one, the mask token 80% of the times, a red, number two, a random token 10% of the time. Number three, an unchanged I token 10% of the time. Then TI will be used to predict the original, original token with cross entropy loss. We compare variational of, variations of this procedure in Appendix C2. So what they mean is that, um, yes, it is true that the most of the times they try to mask and predict the original token, but sometimes actually, instead of putting mask, they all also put um, some random token so this basically this word, this token will be out of place and you need to actually, you don't even know if this is actually, um, um, of course, if you just do that, um, it will be always wrong, but sometimes it will also have correct token. So it could be either correct token or wrong token, or it will be mask and they need to predict what the uh, original token was. If it's a correct token, then they're just, they're just basically copying from the input, All right. Okay, so task two, let's skip this, okay? So you can read this yourself, but then, um, oh, actually we're gonna just see how many um, sentences there are. Mm. So, yeah, so it's binarized, right? So basically that means that they have, they have only two options. It's either correct or wrong. So they have to choose between two sentences. Okay. So they're adding all the uh, token embeddings, segment embeddings and position embeddings in for the inputs. So fine tuning BERT. Uh, fine tuning is straightforward since the self attention mechanism in the transformer allows BERT to model many downstream tasks, uh, whether they involve single text or text pairs, by swapping out the appropriate inputs and outputs. For applications involving text pairs, a common pattern is to independently encode text pairs before applying bidirectional cross attention, uh, such as Craig et al. Actually, the second one is mine. Uh, BERT instead uses the self attention mechanism to unify these two stages. Um, as encoding a concatenated text pair with self-attention effect to include bidirectional cross-attention between two sentences. So what they mean is that basically um, they uh, basically encode the uh, text pairs um, well, basically before they are applying the, well, because they, the transformers have the cross-attention um, uh, inherently, right? So uh, that's what they're trying to say. Um, but then they're saying that they will basically have some bidirectional attention um, that's what they're saying BERT will be benefiting from. 
For each task, we simply plug in the task specific input and outputs into BERT and fine tune all the parameters end to end. At the input, sentence A and sentence B from pre training and are, are analogous to uh, sentence pairs in paraphrasing, hypothesis prim premise pairs in tailment, question passes pairs in question answering, and for a degenerated text, um, null pair in text classification or sequence tagging. At the output, so what they're saying here is that um, whatever the task is, basically they, they, they just put a layer on the top of the, uh, the um, birds and then they just fine tune everything with the, uh, the new layer. Um, and then at the output, the token representations are fed into an output layer for token level tasks, such as sequence tagging or question answering. And the CLS representation is fed into an output layer for classification, such as intelligent or sentiment analysis. So they use CLS if this is a classification, text classification, because we, you basically, when you're doing classification, you need to look at the, um, uh, the entire representation of the sequence. But then when you're doing like token level classification, like uh, NER or um, um, uh, question answering, then basically um, that's, uh, you use the token level embedding instead of a CLS token embedding. I mean the output. When when I'm saying embedding here, I'm not I'm not talking about the input embedding, but the output contextualized the representations. Compared to pre-training, uh, fine-tuning is relatively inexpensive. All of the results in the pe uh, paper can be replicated in at most one hour on a single cloud TPU, and that was really crazy because actually, um, squad models, for instance, they were taking like a few days to train with um, these like heavy LSTMs. And then they're saying that, okay, we give BERT and then use this to fine tune on your target task and you will have a model ready in one hour. And this was like a joke back then that uh, it was actually very quite uh, amazing because what people said is that uh, BERT is so amazing that uh, you basically fine tune this on your target task before you go to lunch and you come back from the lunch and then your model is done. And it's already state of the art and it's better than humans. So that was like the um, really, I mean, I think these days it's not too surprising because, oh, it isn't the fine tuning really like that. But uh, back then, yeah, it wasn't, uh, I mean, it was more typical to actually spend like several days per task to make something work and wasn't even as good as BERT. All right, so I think um, it's, uh, I think uh, they were basically experimenting a few um, on a few data sets. Please, uh, I actually encourage you to take a look at those. Uh, it's really easy read, especially after these. They're just talking about how good they, their model was. So I highly recommend to read that. Um, and then they were talking about the effect of model size. And then um, they say that explore the effect of model size on fine tuning task accuracy. And what they're saying is that actually the model size is very important because the large model is doing much better than the uh, base model in all the tasks. And they also say that, um, actually, where is it? Um, let me see. Yeah, it's not important though. I mean, um, so anyways, they were doing a few other experiments, but it's very short read too. If you look at this, it's like a nine pages, right? They actually didn't really um, add much more to it, to the, the uh, main paper, um, even after being accepted to NACL. Um, I think it makes easier for readers to read this um, because it's not too long. So I highly recommend to read this. Um, and uh, they have some, of course, appendix too, uh, but it's very short read and also easy read, no math, no equations. Um, and so uh, to conclude it, so we're gonna basically uh, do uh, work work with, um, basically uh, try to use birds through the Hugging Face library on Thursday. I think many of you already many uh, may know this, but I, I also think that some of you haven't uh, used BERT. So I think it'll be a good time for you to actually uh, get used to it. Um, and in the next lecture, we're gonna uh, do a similar thing with uh, T5 and GPT-2, mainly because I think the um, these 
settings that we're gonna see in the paper is very actually very um, especially like T five and GPT two, GPT three are very similar. For instance, they're just basically uh, model size is increased, and GPT two is a better benchmark because it's more doable in. I would say, I mean, GPT three you cannot even like uh, replicate um, in yourself, right? It's very large. GP2 at least is kind of doable for some sizes. And uh, T5 is very standard sig to sig model these days. It's basically the standard. So we're gonna go into details as much as we did for BERT, for T5 and GPT2. And then um, last lecture will be more of a um, wrap up, like recent trend, like such as uh, fuchsia learning, um, semi-parametric models, uh, et cetera. But not much. So we we're gonna just talk about what kind of trend there is, and um, hopefully, maybe we'll have a upper level class to this class that talk about more more about the large language model because this class is more about the uh, NLP itself in deep learning. But recently, apparently, the large language models have um, been very popular. So, okay, so I think today's lecture is up to here. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna see you in the last session on Thursday.